Welcome to Cosmic Brilliance. You all will be very happy to meet my new guest today, Christy Martindale, because she happens to be a feline humanoid for all you cat lovers out there. Many of you will be hearing for the first time how this experimental universe actually started. Who exactly are the original founder races? why the fall of man happened and the exciting part towards the end will be very inspirational for you because you will learn what is the real end game positive reason for the creation of humans and why it was so important for all of you to be so courageous to face the many challenges here now the reason i invited christy because other than a few historians, what I've mentioned in other shows is, uh, let's see, Jalela Starr, who is a feline herself. I'm using some of her information and also the fairly well-known guardian historian, Lisa Renee. Christy actually remembers who she is since before her birth and many details of what has occurred since the beginning of our experiment. So I couldn't resist having her on the first show. Mm -hmm. She is what is considered a guardian warrior and her feline species is from one of the two original Christos founder species for this experimental universal game. So folks, before I need to make crystal clear, no pun intended, uh, what I'm referring to by using the word Christo, so there is no misunderstanding. Christ or Christo used in this context we are using today is not pointing to the individual known as Jesus Christ, per se, as taught through the world in religions. Christos describes the state of eternal cosmic consciousness, the title given to a free cosmic citizen, and denotes the unifying principles of the law of one is they are intended by eternal God source. The words Christ, Christos Sophia, Crystal and Crystalla are interchangeable. Christos Sophia is the path of spiritual ascension that leads to our inner discovery of the spark of divinity that exists within our sacred crystal heart and is found within all of creation. So since Christo's consciousness denotes practicing the laws of one, I thought I would give you a quick review, even though we talked about it in past shows, just the seven quick laws of the law of one. One, practice unity, consciousness, and neutrality. Two, love yourself. Three, love others. Four, respect and love earth and nature. Five, Practice service to others. Focus on conscious expansion is the sixth. And the last one is be a responsible co-creator in creation. So with that, welcome, Christy. And thank you for your courage in coming forward publicly for one of your very first times to provide us with the missing pieces of human creation and the rarely, quite frankly, revealed founders and the important purpose for genetically creating the human body. It's going to be very exciting to have you here today. I know you juggle children, lots of animals, and further things have a very full life. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. Sure. For this experimental universal game, humanity originated from the very old constellation Lyra, known for centuries before the ancient Greeks. Even though this constellation is considered relatively small, it is very conspicuous because it has the fifth brightest star in the sky called Vega, also another place where many humans lived. And I'm showing the pictures now as we talk. So Christy, how about you start by describing your Lyran feline species, the Katai? Okay, well, uh, the Katai are a warrior type um, pirate race. And the reason that was, was because there were many wars happening um, early on. 
even after creation, a lot of, of, of wars. The Irma race is a distant cousin of our race, and we uh, kind of branched off from the Irma race, so they're distant cousins. And we decided that we were going to become peaceful, if you will, galactic peaceful warriors to, uh, how do I say this, um, fight for the, the goodness in the universe. We didn't want to take it anymore, and we wanted to stand up for what we believed in and what was right. Well, that's good. Can you describe for our audience what the felines of your race, the Katai, look like? We're tall. Um, we're very tall. Um, in my Lyran form, I'm about 12 to 13 feet tall. Um, we have a soft fuzz over our body. So it's like a kind of a peach fuzz and it varies from spots to stripes and different, many different colors. Um, we have manes, uh, with the felines, the female felines also have sort of a, like hair that's like a mane, um, in the lion species and a little bit of a mane for a tiger, even though tigers don't have manes, we have, we have hair. What about eye color? Our eyes vary from a really deep blue uh, to a deep green to sometimes gold, depending on the species and depending on the, the hybrid, whether it's a lion tiger or even a black leopard tiger. There were many, there were lynx too, and many that bred interbred with each other. Interesting. And are, um, are cats on earth that are very curious by nature, of course, are they similar to qualities of your species? They are very much so. Uh, what What are other things about your culture, families? Um, we're very family oriented to start with. Um, we, the feline females are, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say a little bit about tigers and a little about the lionesses, the tigresses and the lionesses. Um, they differ in a lot of ways. The tiger, tigresses take care of all of the cubs. So they all the, all the females get together, take care of the cubs. And they're pretty laid back with their cubs. Playful, little, just easygoing. And where the lionesses are, they got their paws down on their, on their cubs going, no, don't be rolling in that mud you know you've got to got things you got to do so there's there's different discernment on how these cubs are raised and for what purposes mm -hmm. so the lions are a little more strict they so are they are stern so they do the tough love thing they do the, yeah. the tigresses are more on the playful side i'm not going to listen to the rules or the regulations and and when you have a lion dad it makes it really hard Oh, yeah, I bet. The <laughs> the Irma species, which we'll talk about is as, as one of the original founders. I know they are considered, so I imagine yours are too, that the felines in general are have traits of it, they're very intellectual, they're extremely telepathic, they basically have an optimistic attitude and a warmth. Is that true with your Katai yeah. race? It is. We're we're a little more on the warrior side. <laughs> oh. Even though we're playful, we still have chosen to be a little more renegade, a little more pirate-like, where the Irma have settled down a little bit more, even though they wear armor and they wear, you know, robes and stuff like that and adorn themselves with um nice jewels. We all we, all of us, all of us cats love jewelry. We love the nice stones and like to be adorned in them so it's a it's a feline trait <laughs> and are probably good treasure hunters too so oh very to hunt. <laughs> definitely okay so um i know from my studies that the irma are generally eight to 12 feet tall and the the first were like lion tigers and they branch off into other felines so <clears throat> you said you're really tall how tall were you again like what is the katai I'm, for males and females uh we're a little bit taller than the irma race um and i think it just it happened over time 
Mm -hmm. A little bit on the thinner side where they're there, it depends. It really depends on the species and what species are interbreeding with each other. So it's kind of hard to say if, if you have, you know, two species that you're like a black leopard and a, a lynx or something that they're going to be more slender. If you're breeding heavier built uh, felines like tigers, they're going to be a little more on the thicker side. Or even if you're a male and you're a lion and a male tiger, you're going to have that that real massive look to you. So depending on you know your 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 sex, what you are, and what your body type is in in genetics, it's going to vary. That makes total sense. Thank mm -hmm. you. This is so much fun. <laughs> what is if I'm allowed to ask? I know it's very improper. What is your feline current age and your average lifespans? Um, I am 16 years old. In <laughs> <laughs> I am a teenager, a rebellious teenager, and loving every minute of it. Um, because we're very curious to begin with, adventurous and. We just love adventure. We're very curious. The, the saying curiosity, yeah, about cats is very true. It gets us into a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm 16. In tiger years. In ti tigress years, yes. Tigress tig years. We, the Katai can live up to about 800 years. So, and then I wanted to mention versus our cousins, the Irma, they live to be about 900 or so. They're li they actually have a little longer lifespan than we do not by not only by 100 years oh that's interesting yeah, yeah. that's the entire lifespan of humans <laughs> right You're like only by 100 and years 100 years <laughs> that's give or take you know what i mean yes well i'm showing on screen now because like most hybrids they have extra and unusual body parts so you were brave enough these are pictures of christy mm -hmm. and her different forms and she was brave enough to show you an unusual feature. So do you want to share what that is? These are bone structures yeah. that are a, um, an extra vertebrae bone. They're actually a bone casing that are on your ribs. And they're a feline trait. And they also, um, the Irma have them as well. So that was protection in case, you know, when we were battling and fighting, that was our extra protection that we needed. And it's just a genetic trait that's been passed down through our lineages. Oh, interesting. You know, too, I was curious because I heard um, I heard something and I want to see from your experience if this is right. And, and how how equal are the male and females of the Katai and Irma? How do they look at each other in terms of feminine roles, male roles, how they act, that kind of thing? Um, well, not too different, to be honest with you. We're we're pretty similar. Like I said, we're distant cousins. Mm -hmm. So it it it's where the Katai being more anthrotype cat, we're um we're a little we vary and we're more we're more refined, I guess, in more of a, a warrior type sense, but for a good purpose. And there and the Irma are, are kind of they're just more masculine looking, even the females. Mm -hmm. So there's a little refinery between us and the Irma. Are they considered equals? Yes. All felines are considered equals. Good. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I want people to hear because yes. what I know, they are treated with great reverence in the feline species. Yes, very much so. Uh, there's a lot of honor and, and, you know, dignity and gratitude and just a lot of that that goes above and beyond and like you were saying you know um it's a lot it's a lot about service to others not service to self so even through our races we have to learn how to hold ourselves in a certain manner or you know respect all life even though we choose to to take a more of a warrior type path that doesn't mean that we're destructive we don't want to fight but we are the ones that will if we need to fight. But there, there is a, a respect, a great respect that goes amongst the feline races and for each other and for all other life species as well. The other person I, I studied from like over 20 years ago and I took her courses and read her books. She was a feline. She wasn't an anthro. She was a feline in a human body and she taught much about that. And 
Um, so I'll be sharing some of her information too, and then be asking Christy if she agrees or whatever, since Christy has a lot of memory of a lot and she can validate or verify both Lisa Renee's and Jalela's info. So uh, at the very beginning of this universe experimental duality free will game, two species were chosen by the Elohim and creation that had achieved successful ascension in their universe. Now, quote, this is from Jalela. These two species were willing to set up and oversee this game that was to begin in Ly Lyra, referred to as the birthplace or cradle of Lyra. The ones that chose the more service to others duality were 47 white felines, and the other ones that chose to play the service to self duality were the carrions, avians, the chokzuri that were usually blue in color. So what most people don't know is that the felines created the human race genetically. Okay, and most people have never been told this. And the avians brought in the reptilians for duality purposes. So when the felines came here, they originally were very high dimensional vibration and were in etheric form, which Christy in a few moments will, or a little later, will describe her personal experience of that. And many had a home planet called Avion. These white felines who were highly skilled in genetics and creation itself spent many incarnations producing the most useful feline biped and human biped by adding in a bipedal ape that was evolving on Avion as well. So the Irma decided to keep their feline features and some fangs <laughs> yet with a with a more human-like body capable of also walking on two legs. And it was during this genetic hybridization that the royal lines of Avion or the houses of Avion were created. Now, Avion was considered a very beautiful planet in the Pleiades that the founders gave the feline similar to our earth in beauty and colors. And on Avion though, there was a difference. They never got stuck in the animal reincarnating cycle like humans did evolving on earth today. So incarnating felines did and continue to come to earth to provide DNA upgrading, but more often to help ascension, purification and higher principles to assist their brothers and sisters who got stuck here in incarnation cycles and forgot who they are. In time, the felines multiplied enough to become planetary guardians on Avion and as scientists, geneticists, and space explorers respected their planet and developed advanced space warp drive technology. Now, here's an interesting point. <laughs> Another interesting point, I should say. It was at this time that these felines wished to help the bipedal ape-like mammal by genetically upgrading the apes and giving them a soul, which is very high ethics and beautiful to see. So in that process, here we go, folks, they created a new species that became known as human. So thousands of years of genetic crossbreeding later, the feline human hybrids became more common in the royal lines and in the house of Avion. So they were not just the purebred felines anymore. So if any of you are feeling a strong connection with cats and felines down here, it is even to this day that those royal houses continue to be the guardians of us humans who they consider their genetic offspring throughout time and dimensions. And if you want to know why you're opening and closing doors for them, there's your answer. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christy, uh, please describe the details of what you remember of coming into this game, starting with seeing the cradle of Lyra being created, or Lyra, it's pronounced both ways, the home base of the genetic and angelic human race. Okay, so when the when the cradle of Lyra was was being created, and I was aware of it being created, um, I was in a different, I was in a different density, first of all. Um, 
it's almost like my light body was part of the creational process. So a liquid plasma type connection that I had with the creation of the of the cradle itself. So I was I was part of it, but I was also watching it being birthed into creation, if you will, if you can. <laughs> um, and this whole process of the of this specific genetic coding that came through from from many of these races came through to bring forth the genetic coding and the, and the divine uh, original divine blueprint um, that we use to create the genetic template for the Christic angelic human races. Wow. Okay, so now, do, so you were watching and you were in it. So what did it feel like being? It was conscious. Yes, it was. I was part of the consciousness, but I was also observing the consciousness happening at the time. Wow, that's so cool. Because yeah. that's kind of what we're trying in an advanced consciousness. We're trying to be the observer and also participating at the same time, right? Right. And that's, yes, exactly. Um, so you can look at something in a solid matter form, or you can actually, um, be part of that. We're all part of that original consciousness. It's just trying to get ourselves back on that track. Wow. Okay. So there was this, so basically you came in in a light body mm -hmm. and then how did that light body get anchored in some way? Like what? What did it feel like? What did it appear to be? What did it? Um, it was a trans. It was actually a transcending um, type of fluid involvement of of one's higher self, if you if I could say that. So, uh, in in a sense, a descent, a descending type of uh, like water flowing, you know, flowing outward and downward or onward. And our consciousness and our and our higher self doing that be in a creational process. Oh, that's so cool. I love to hear that. And that you remember this is so amazing. So I do I don't know. And and folks, I, I'd like to say here a little caveat for Christy. We've spent hours and hours and hours and hours preparing a show and going through, you know, thousands of pages of different things. And so she's taken notes separately on her memories of everything so um in case you see her looking at notes and stuff please just allow that because you have no idea that we're trying to simplify the amount of information which is amazing okay that is, that is correct just <laughs> there's a lot that. going on here <laughs> just saying that okay so now christy we know that in most creations um we use light sound and color ray frequencies and vibrations to create life. So that was true in this, it's true in this universe. So yes. I understand that ours started with the three bold flames. And can you describe the color of these flames of creation and what they are? So the threefold founder flames um, of, of our God, our universe um, was mostly violet, gold, and the greenish blue. Um, there was the fifth harmonic universe, um, composed of these threefold founder rays and the magenta violet color is 15 D the blue ray is 13 D and the gold ray is 14 D. So meaning dimensional. Okay. And what, what does the 15 D represent? The magenta color. Um, violet color is 15D, and that defined the father principle. Um, the blue ray is in 13 dimension and defines the mother principle. And the gold ray is in 14th D and describes the son of Christosophia and the attributed to the neutral, what we call the, the raw confederacy. These three 13th through 15th density groups were the 13D emerald order who incarnated as hominid white feline angelic beings called the Anuhazi and incarnated through the 12th stargate in Lyra called the called Aramantena. The 14th gold order, Seraphi, Seraphim Ra Confederacy, 
the Rock Confederacy seated, the Seraphim serve as blue avian beings, and the golden Athean mantis, tall whites of the solar Rishi beings through 10 Stargate in Lyra Vega. 15D amethyst order of soli, solar Rishi beings were comprised of cetacean, <clears throat> dolphin, and whales, um, avian Pegasus people, and the Braharama aquatic people who incarnated through the 11th Stargate in Lyra Avion. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, so Lisa Renee's work is similar to that. And and so that's like 100% accuracy between you both. Okay, folks. So the next thing is we want to have it exact. And I'm going to follow what Lisa Renee says about the sounds used, which will be important for humans to use also, that were involved in these three aforementioned groups, right? The 13th, 14th, and 15D groups. So these three group embodiments are always used to hold the tone sequence in matter, antimatter, as the bass, the overtone, and the resonator also known as the positive, the negative, and the neutral components. In our pre-talk, I took notes and you mentioned, Christy, which is amazing that you are a creator being and emerged from consciousness like you were describing in the form of a light body. And then you created light codes and DNA into awareness of the great I am mm -hmm. using these light rays you just talked about and the sounds we're gonna talk about next and frequencies. And so you were one of the creators that hold all the templates of the seeds of the first eternal creations. Now, out of that came the major sound forms, five of them folks, this is spelled A-H-T-A-R-A-S-H-A-K-E-E -E, for those of you taking notes and want to use these. Ah, ta, ra, sha, ki. So uh, Christy, does that relate to you? And I believe you also said that the three sounds had corresponding colors to the higher heavens in the 13th, 14th and 15th density. So what are those sounds from those three densities and what what uh, color? Could you you know review that for us, please? Sure. sure. Um, the 13th density is key. It's blue. It's a blue ray with some green turquoise. The 14th density is raw, which is our gold ray. And the 15th density, sha, magenta ray, uh, pink and violet. Great. Well, that... Um, so how do you feel? Does does what I shared with what Lisa Renee work talks about with so far with the colors and sounds? Uh, is that match with what you saw, what you know as a creator being when you were experiencing this? It does. It does re resonate with me 100%. Um, it, and it's great to get confirmation on a lot of this stuff. I'm sure because as you're remembering this, I'm sure at times you go like, am I making it up? Is it crazy? Whatever, right? Yes. And this certainly is not taught in uh, public schools, needless to say. So um, she also mentions there's frequency, tone, and geometry recorded in our silicate, which refers to crystal, in our silicate matrix of our DNA that is used to upgrade our crystal DNA by using certain crystal tones so to the tone the three tones that you said she also writes of the seven letter acronym but she's uh by the way folks the c is in crystal is often spelled with a k also so the seven letter letter acronym is k r y s t a l that gives the seven crystal tones of creation which are ka Ra, Ya, 
saw, ta, ah, double A, and la. Now, why do you need to know this? Those tones are used for encoding our true, what's called diamond sun blueprint. So that means when we tone these individually, they hold a piece of the larger schematic that fits into our unified Christos blueprint. And with the addition of ha, she said, I thought she meant laughter, but she didn't. Uh, she added ka, ra, ya, sa, ta, ha, la, or kristala, which represents the merged divine male and female ascended Christos body. Mm -hmm. So that, which I thought was so cool, don't you? I do. Yeah. I, so I, here's still the, right on too. <laughs> yeah, I know people will be taking notes on this one. So here's a very important key for all of us to know uh, and to practice, hopefully. Sounding or, this is from Lisa Renee. Sounding or communicating with these tones in meditation, prayer, music, or breath work is helpful to focus the mind, breaking and helping to break programmed control patterns and activates what's called our breastplate shield of protection that brings, here's the cool part, brings into integration our soul with our oversoul. And that's a big deal here. Okay, so she continues. The source Godhead can be reached by sounding the Christos consciousness, crystal star tones you've just been given. This process unifies consciousness, your consciousness with the Godhead. This crystal architecture is that which allows the synchronized phasing of the inner and outer and in between currents of energy to be inhaled and exhaled, thus circulating the eternal spark of life and creation through your entire organism. So you want to use your breath along with this and breathing. Christos is the unified state of energetic balance between the masculine and feminine that are manifested in a male or female body. And on the path of Christos Sophia, we consciously participate to transform and build our light body and understand the law of one in fulfilling our spiritual purpose to achieve unconditional love, respectful neutrality, and peace and harmony with creation. It's an end quote from Lisa, and I thought that was beautiful. What do you think about that, Christy? It's beautiful. It's just very, very right. <laughs> so it resonates with your knowingness of what you experienced and what you use. Yes. Okay. So... Um, Lisa in that mentioned light body and I want to make sure everyone understands what light body means. So could you just briefly tell us what light body is? A light body is your etheric higher form before creation, before you come into a higher, a lower form of create of density and, and, and acquire a physical form. So your light body is your, your energetic field, your etheric field, where, where your higher self is. It is your higher self, actually. And we all have it. We all have a light body. And we're all connected to our light body. It's just activating that light body again and, and activating the DNA that we have in our physical body now to merge with our light body. So Christy, please continue with the three founder genetic races and the important connections of Stargates which folks, for those of you that don't know about all the stargates all over the world and beyond other worlds, that is one of the number one reasons for most wars and what they're fighting over because that is ultimate control of space travel, trade, and many other things. So um, Christy, do you want to, uh, do you remember the three founder races that created densities 13th through 15th in the liquid light field, like you were saying? 
Um, the, the feline hominid, hominid Christo founders and the Lyran, the 5D was the Lyran aquatic whites um, on, on planet and protected Aram antenna Stargate 12. Um, the second was the Seraphi Seraphim, the blue avians and us, us Lyrans, we call them the Chaksuri. That's our name for the, the, the avians. Um, and a reptile, a reptilian insect blend called the, the Ceres bird people, um, who were 4D gold order to protect the Lyra Vega 10 Stargate, the Stargate that I came through to my home planet on 7D Malacqua. So my home um, was where I came through that Stargate. It was a very important Stargate for us. The Braharama aquatic ape Pegasus Inu Christos whale people, like the Seta, who the original, who were the original record keepers. And the whales carry frequencies and tones to open DNA. And the 4D Amethyst Order Brenoa protected the Lyra Avion Stargate 11. Wow. So folks, that gives you a sense of these ancient, quote, species and that we often have, we have pretty much all representatives on this planet. So these are examples of much older forms of those. <laughs> so Christy, I have a kind of fun question. I remember white winged lions. So I'm wondering if you've ever come across them in your experiences or met them, because I think they're one of the most ancient ones. Actually, I have. Oh, <laughs> um, cool. Uh, they don't see them very often, um, but I have seen one in particular. Um, they like to go by the name the Ishanue, and they are what uh, my species, the Katai, called them, we called them the elders oh. because they were from an elder race in our eyes and very ancient. Um, there happens to be one particular uh, Ishanue that I knew by the name of Demobius, and he was very regal, and I interacted with him a long time ago. And like I said, you don't you don't really see them. They don't interact very often. Um, They're definitely part of the Christos lineage, you know. They are. Yes, they are. I mean, that's that's what I feel. And what do the wings look like? It are they? It is he or her? Demobius. They almost look. They almost look like a Pegasus on a lion. How cool is that? And uh, did they have any other color? Do they have gold or blue or any other color on them? No. Um, they mostly white and gold. They're they're not. They don't usually take on a lot of the other colors. Thank you. I'm so glad someone knew about them. Woohoo! That is great fun for me. So now, are you actually from this multiverse or somewhere else? No, uh, Malakwa is in another uh, multiverse. It's actually we're actually hyper dimensional. So we can travel uh, in ways that you wouldn't even believe possible. Ooh, cool. And, and, and what dimension <laughs> is that universe that you came from? Well, we're, we're in dimensions. We're in dimension seven. So seventh dimension. But we have traveled up to dimension, the ninth dimension. So we can travel back and forth from seven to nine. Okay. And you know, oh, this is yeah, kind of a, a, I don't know if you, you can tell me this or if it's too complicated. How can you give me an example of what it's like to travel from one dimension to another? Uh, it depends. It depends. I mean, um, it can be scary and it can be fun and exciting. If you're and this is, I'm going to say this, when we're when we're traveling in those higher dimensions, we really don't. Even though we have a a body, a form, we really don't feel that we have it when we're traveling. So it's it's kind of more of a a plasma type field that we're traveling within. 
Do you so feel it, like it's, you're it's disintegrating? Terrible. No, it's still in a form, but you, you don't realize you have it at the time of travel. Wow. So is it kind of like a light body? Is that what a light body is or something completely different? Yes, kind of a few steps down from a light body because you're still working on your your etheric field and your energy, but you're still physical, a physical form as well. So you're kind of in between. That's part of that hyperspace. The hyperspace travel is in between. It's in between what is reality, what's form, and what is not, but you're still holding ground on both sides. Without going crazy. Mm -hmm. It does require a lot of mental travel as well. So it's consciousness. It, it's bringing consciousness down through your light body, connecting down into your physical form, holding your physical form, but still being able to come up and travel through your higher realms of consciousness as well and keeping it all together. So it's called hyper hyperdimensional or hyperspace hyperdimensional space travel. I love that. Right when you said that, the Zoom gl glitched into hyperspace. Oh no! <laughs> no, it was good. It was perfect. <laughs> it's like hyperdimensional. <laughs> that was fun. Okay, so uh wow because i was going to ask you what hyperdimensional means so thank you for that and and when you say it takes a lot of mental focus it, are you actually picturing where you're going to are you actually holding that or not so much yeah yeah you you do you hold a a thought of of what you're doing or where you're going and it and it's 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 more mental i guess you would say than anything but you do take your physical form with you Oh, that's so neat that you remember and know this. Now, I'm going to ask a personal question. I'm not sure if you want to reveal it. I would like to know your DNA. Obviously, you're feline, but mm -hmm. what other DNA do you have mixed with that? Well, I have human DNA because I'm human as well. And I, I carry the angelic Christos lineages as well. Um, I, I also carry some, um, I don't know if you want to say a, a reptilian type draconian DNA and a, and some of the dragon lineages as well. And, and don't, don't, don't underestimate that because just because, you know, somebody speaks of that, that is a, a lineage that's very old and not all draconians, not all dragons, and not all reptilians are bad. There is good and bad in every species. But some of that DNA has been uh, important to, to bind certain other DNAs together. So it's like glue. And it works both ways. Human for humans, for hybrids, for different species. Uh, you know, we don't. We don't want to underestimate other races. And I also wanted to point out that all races, whether they're they're enlightened races or whether they're part of what we call the, the negative alien agenda, they are all part of creation. They are all part of God's source and they're all trying to get back to creation. And if we can help them get back to creation, that's part of our Christos miss mission here as well that, well that we need to help our brothers and sisters the ones that need the help more than some of the others well said well said thank you now i don't know if you want to reveal but in terms of are you connected at all to the royal english queen lineage at all um yes <laughs> okay. i am okay i am um all right. That's what I can say, but yes, Malignage. I am. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. Yep. Well, those genetics have a punch. I guess I'm going to have to start being nice to you. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> now I know that Christmas dragons come in several colors. So um, I'm curious uh, which ones you may have met. And uh, okay. Let me think. I can tell you a little bit about some of my dragon friends. Um I I have met many dragons, first of all, I want to say, in different varieties, different species and different colors. Um, 
and they all have had different reasons and purposes for interaction with me. Um, I know there are a lot of people out there who love dragons and, and who have had interactions with them. There are Christos dragons. There are other dragons um, that are not Christos, but that doesn't make them bad dragons. And then again, there are some dragons that aren't so nice, just like there are Lyrans that aren't so nice. Everybody thinks that because we're a feline race, we're all just happy and perfect, but that doesn't happen in these multiverses. You know, remember, there are good and bad in every single species, and that goes for humans too. But the dragons are ancient, and they're ancient souls, and they're here to protect, and they're guardians. They are guard come from guardian, old ancient guardian races. They're protectors. They're actually very intelligent, very, um, how do you say it? Telepathic. Um, telepath oh, yes, telepathic, definitely. But they're... They're majestic, if you will. They have a majestic sense about them. They're loyal. They're logical. And they have a sense of purpose, which they like to share with people. So I honor the dragons. I really do. Um, I've seen a lot of them throughout my travels, throughout my time. I'm very close to a lot of them. And I just want to put it out there that dragons are more than what you even think they are mm. and um, that you should honor them and respect them. And the, most of all, talk to them, because if they if you have the pure, a pure heart and you're open to them, they will they will communicate with you. So give give it a chance and see what happens. <laughs> That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Now, in terms of the Christos dragons, which I know are very high level, um, did they yeah. help us at all in the human fall that we're going to talk about later? Did they help? Um, yeah. yeah, they they have many missions. And, and you know, so I, some of the missions, believe it or not, these drag a lot of these dragons don't talk about. They just, they come and they do. They're not just going to say, oh, hey, I'm here to do this or I'm here to do that. They just come in, they do their job, and they go. And uh, that's what just makes them so amazing. Um, we are actually at the in the process right now of not only healing our own body and our own templates and our own um, DNA blueprints, but we are healing the the uh, earth grids because the earth needs healed too. There are many things that they come here to do, and they have an agenda to to come forth and to help. That's so beautiful i love them and honor them yes i do too i really do and okay so um i want you send me pictures of you in your form and i know people okay. want to want to see that so i'm putting pictures up now and you appear to be holding some kind of maybe weapon something that looks like a blade so can you tell us what that is and and maybe describe some of your abilities if they're okay well what i'm holding is like it's called a batleth it's like a batleth um it it was part of my my weaponry that i used when i taught blade dancing on malacqua um on my home planet of malacqua uh there we had a we had a high uh a temple called the alabaster temple and it was also a, a library a learning library that you could go in and learn things and experience things inside there and a big it had a big cathedral ceiling um we had waterfalls and it was just a beautiful place and i would teach blade dancing there now blade dancing um was a tai chi type movement that we used with weapons and so there was fluid movement and it had weapons to use um and you had to be careful because I used to swing it under my tail. And I was when I was first learning, I didn't want to cut my tail off. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but it's dangerous even for us. So there was that. And then. Um, and then your abilities, like some of your abilities. My, well, our abilities, we worked on constantly. Um, we did a lot of remote viewing. We did a lot of healings there. Um, we used we used things like herbs too. And we had like, I guess what you would call living waters. We had waters that were pure 
and that would run through your bodies and, and it, everything was very pure back then. Um, I could levitate things, but I used that through a technique of, I guess you would say like an energy type manipulation, but we also used what you call um, a light sculpting. We would take light and we would learn how to manipulate the light sound frequency and sculpt things out of light. So I made my first Merkaba and I was very proud of myself. I was about 10 years old and I created a light frequency and made this Merkaba and it was beautiful and it was spinning around and I'm almost so excited. I ran around telling everybody, look what I made, look what I made. <laughs> I was just so happy that I could do it and hold its frequency right where it was. Oh, wow. But that's what we were taught. That's what we were learning. And, and we had technology that we had to learn just like human, you know, kids had to go to school. You have to learn this while well, our parents wanted us to learn, you know, these things too, so that we could use them for good throughout the universe. If we didn't learn them. We kind of got in trouble. So we had to sit and practice. Wow. Okay. So as um, the pictures show, you're a white tiger hybrid and that you have blue eyes right right and you probably would have stripes rather than spots or do you have both i have both um Show off. okay so let, me, let me explain <laughs> let me explain my mom was a tigress my dad was a lion um i was also adopted and in a weird say i was adopted by another lion too so i kind of had two dads um so I, I got spots and I got stripes in my genetics. Um, that is so cool. Yeah. So cool. Okay. Now is that planet behind you? Uh, is that Malakwai? Is that represents that's, Malakwai? Yeah, that's Malakwai. That's your home planet. Malakwai. Yeah. Malakwai. Malakwai. Yep. Yeah. It was, it was a very, it was a beautiful place. Um, we, we mostly had green lush fields and forests. We had a lot of waterfalls everywhere. Um, gardens big beautiful gardens that we would walk through so everything was very beautiful um our sky when it when it would we have our sunset that the planet would turn purple and pink mm -hmm. so there would be a big hue of purple and pink that would just kind of rise up from the planet oh how cool that's it's very that's very beautiful so place beautiful. to live now you have this interesting red and black symbolic picture what does that represent that's my name um that's a symbol of what my name means in the katai language and my name is asia of the silenced blade because i blade danced that's what they named me and it's also of the whispering wind so through the wind um i would blade dance Ooh. That does sound dangerous. <laughs> it was very dangerous. Especially if you have a tail. Did you ever yeah, to I, like hook your tail up when you were doing this? I had to learn to hold my tail up when I was blade dancing because if I, I let it come down or it got in the way or whatever, it could be not so good. Can you use your tail for tripping people and things though? No, no, <laughs> no. I mostly balance. Okay. I, if I did that, I I'm saying if you ever fought or anything, could you use it as a as a good swipe or tripping or anything? Um, no, I never did do that, but um, I was afraid my dad would yell at me. Oh, yeah, we'll get into her dad is, and you'll see the picture, so you'll understand. <laughs> okay, so uh, I want you the next question. I'm I'm hoping you'll be able to do. And you're going to have to probably get really close to the microphone because we don't have the vocal cords to do this. Is I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you to imitate how a tiger says hello. Tigers use a vocal called a chuff. And they use them here on Earth that way. Now, you got to understand for Lyrans, um, Katai, Irma, uh, any of the races of the feline races, it, in this day and age, we don't have those vocal cords anymore. So there's still a little bit there, but not like we did when we were back home. So a chuff is a hello. It's a welcoming sign. 
And I, and if you've ever visited with a tiger at a zoo or had to, you know, bottle fed one or whatever, you'd know what it sounds like. So bear with me, but it's kind of like, and it's just a chuff and it means hello and a greeting and welcome. And how are you? Um, that's, that's so how cool. to say hello. It's almost got a slight purr thing in there, but it, it tigers yeah. don't purr because oh. they're too big to purr. Okay. But we say that we kind of all say that we go, yeah, yeah we're because it's a loving kind of response. Uh -huh. So we think of a purr as a domesticated cat. That's their way of vibrating their vocal cords and giving you affection. Uh -huh. We can't really do the purr thing, but we can chuff. And then we would we would rub heads or rub bodies and give affection to each other. OK, which makes sense. It's like tigers here do that, too, on Earth. So what about lions? Put your they... head down and kind of rub. Lions, on the other hand, have a guttural, a real deep guttural sound that comes way down from their belly and their diaphragm, and it comes up through their vocal cords and out with a real type of, I mean, a real distinct bellow or roar that they can bring out. And and when, you know, you're not expecting that, it can be, it can be quite scary when you're, when you're, dad comes up or somebody comes up your brother or whatever and they just roar at you and you're like oh my goodness what did I do because they normally don't roar unless they need to get your attention <laughs> oh yeah yeah okay I, I did I, I cleaned my room I, I promise <laughs> <laughs> okay that's so wonderful is there anything else you'd like to share about their actions and what they do and how they relate to one another culturally or anything like that? Uh, well, okay. Um, there's like, there's a lot of, um, let's see here. There's a lot of, a lot of, I don't know if you want to call it stern, being stern, but just being regal and um, proper. Proper, yes. Proper and Etiquette. Diplomat diplomatic as well. There's a lot of diplomacy and just a lot of, you know, I am Irma or I am Katai, you know, I'm very right. proud sense amongst the people, the feline people. They're proud of who they are. They're very, you know, feline. Not trying to say that they, there's, there, there is ego there because there's not, they're not really egotistical, but they're, they're just proud of who they are as a species. They're they very loving and caring. It sounds like they've learned something that humans on this planet need to learn, which is self-love. Yes. Yes. We all need self-love. Right. Um, if we do not have self-love, we cannot truly love others. Yes. So it's really important for us to unselfishly love ourselves and unselfishly love others and not expect anything in return. Love is not selfish. It's selfless right on exactly mm -hmm. i love that thank you um i'm gonna have to talk to the cats down here though because they happen to think they own us i always thought cats were mm -hmm. from off world studying the weird behavior of humans <laughs> that's how they look at you you know like right. excuse me <laughs> yes i have some i have cats too imagine that i wouldn't be without cats in my life no um, and they do kind of try to train me, but they, it's funny because like when I look at them and stuff, they still know I'm the head cat Oh, and yeah. I'm like, I'm bigger than you guys, you know, but it's all done with love. There's no force or anything involved. I just have to look at them in the eyes and there's, there's an understanding. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, they're very telepathic, of course, and they would be with you and you would they be. Are. Yeah. Delilah, a star mentioned that um, the felines are the storytellers and maintain the historical records of this <laughs> game. Does that resonate with you? It does with me. It does resonate with me. And of, of course, like I said, we had a library on Malacqua. So yes, yes, um, we are storytellers and we like to pass down the old stories and even stories from the Isha Nui, the elders, which were called the elders, is it, all this star knowledge and galactic history is very important and needs to be, you know, taken care of because this is the true history that has been lost and it's been lost within all of us. And that's 
part of why our mission is to regain all this knowledge and to find our way home to our to our, the galactic center where we belong. Thank you. And the feline Christos lineages are the ones that are the most dedicated to that. One of the ones. Yes, they are. Yes, I appreciate they are. That. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Lisa Renee from her Ascension Glossary Articles folks, which are volumes and volumes, but amazing. She, I'm going to uh, quote what she has to say, which is, quote, predecessors to our human angelic race were the Lyran Syrian whites called the Anuhazi, who are a feline hominid seated by the 12th D Elohim and are one of the Christos founder races. So the Lyran Syrian whites or Anuhazi are, as you said, Christy, this is like validating what you said, are human mm -hmm. elders. They are a yeah. pale skin hominid Lyran Syrian race, sometimes frequently called the guardian founders, who protect what is called the diamond sun body. Uh, and another way of saying that they protect the 12 strand DNA blueprint that was originally given to humans. Does that resonate with you? Yes, it does. And that's very true. Okay. They're very true. And the other group, the um Ceres avians, the Chaksuri, with the blue skin, yeah. I believe in my um, studying, they were the second group, felines here, second group, that uh, did a lot of the 12-strand DNA for humans genetically and contributed that. That's true, too. That's true, very too? True. Yep. Yep. This information is very accurate. Cool.